G'day guys and gal. The Primarchs are an interesting group of dudes, each one representing a different aspect of the God Emperor of Mankind, as well as one of his many mental disorders. These mental disorders were a key contributor to the galaxy taking a massive L. I mean, I mean they were severe enough to cause half of the Primarchs to pledge their souls to the forces of hell, with not a whole lot of convincing required. These problems range from daddy issues, anger management, all the way to severe autism, with each of these little conditions being easily identical from the day that their golden daddy came down from the heavens to collect them. You might be like, Major Kill, why are you talking about the Primarch's lack of chromosomes? This video is about the Emperor meeting the Primarchs. Well, Terence, that's because each meeting between the Primarch and the Emperor was basically a literal metaphor for their said disability, and pretty much dictated how the rest of their lives would pan out. Today we'll look at the brief origins of each of the Primarchs and then the moment they met their daddy. We'll go from the 1st Legion all the way to the 20th, also discussing which meetings were the best, slash which were the more interesting, and which ones were pretty lame. Let's get into it. The first of the Primarchs was Lionel Johnson, who despite his name, was actually white. The lion landed on Caliban, which was extremely epic, as it was full of chaos mutated monsters and... Techno Knights. By the time the Big E arrived on Caliban, the Lion had already led a successful crusade against the Monsters of Hell. If any Primarch should get an origin movie, it should be this guy, like Techno Knights fighting Hell Monsters, led by the blackest white guy around. Hell yeah. The arrival of the Emperor on Caliban was reasonably uneventful. The Lion quickly recognised this guy as his daddy, and his Techno Knights were pretty hyped about the prospect of becoming Demigod Techno Knights. The only incident was when a group of knights, who wanted to maintain the use of their reproductive organs, tried to assassinate the Emperor. However, trying to assassinate the Emperor as a Techno Knight is like Stephen Hawking trying to beat the Rock in a fistfight. It's just a bit sad. Overall, the Lion's greeting was a good reflection of his character. He has always been a very level-headed man, so when a shining golden godman knocks on his door, offering the galaxy, he accepted it with his usual levels of cold autism. Onto the second Primarch, who we have absolutely no idea about other than the fact that he is dead and no one talks about him. From this I can only assume he landed on the fairy planet and adopted their ways, being mercy killed by the Emperor upon his discovery. The third Primarch's affliction was obvious from the get-go, Narcissism. The most interesting part about Fulgrim's origin is that it should have shaped an entirely different Primarch. Chemos was a dying world where all forms of art and pleasure had been sacrificed in order to meet a ration quota to keep the people alive. You would have thought this would result in a hardened Primarch, whose only concern was efficiency and only using what you need, but instead we got this dude. This is probably because the Eldar God of Memes and Spaghetti swapped Fulgrim and the Khan's planet, but details, details. Fulgrim was an ass kisser, so as soon as the Big E met him, he literally dropped to his knees and attempted to perform fellatio on him. Metaphorically, of course, this was pre-Rape Snake Fulgrim, so not quite yet the disgrace he would soon become. Another pretty boring Primarch meeting, but makes complete sense. Despite coming after Fulgrim and his Pink Marines, the fourth Primarch could not have been more different. Perturabo. Now some Primarchs were negatively skewed from the start. Perty was born with the ability to know how to do everything, which sounds cool until you realise that the joy of discovery and curiosity were completely absent from his life. That, plus the fact that he could always see the Eye of Terror, meant he suffered from the mental affliction known as being a complete dick. It wasn't always to be this way. Purdy was a Primarch that was dealt a shit hand, but still dared to hope that people cared about him. When the Emperor came, Purdy was so excited to meet his dad. It was the first time he felt wonder and awe, so it was actually really sad reading the excerpt on when it happened. Purdy metaphorically sucked off the Big E even harder than Fulgrim did when he met him, instantly kneeling, pledging allegiance, and even shedding a tear. Little did he know that the Big E just intended to throw him at the most horrific sieges that would create a legion of salty ass roided dudes, but this one moment was nice. So far, every Primarch, other than the Fairy, has welcomed the Emperor with open arms. On to the fifth Primarch, we have the Khan, who suffers from the mental condition of being an Asian aka overthinking things and having a micro penis. The Khan, like most Primarchs other than that, you know, dipshit living abortion Angron, conquered his planet and had a good time. When the Emperor arrived and gave his usual spiel, the Khan did immediately pledge to him. However, later journal recordings would show a very pragmatic reason behind it beyond just, you know, genetic loyalty. The Khan didn't want to instantly become a servant of a new master only six months after becoming Lord of his planet. But he realised that if he genuinely said no, he would die. And also, he didn't mind the Emperor's system, as well as the Imperial Truth. 
Also, the only way the Khan would ever become the speed was with the Emperor's Dopa space bikes. The Khan's extremely reasonable approach to things would carry on to the Horus Heresy when Mortarion, or Morty as I like to call him, was like, oh, oh geez, Khan, oh, I think you should like uh, join Chaos and stuff, like kill, kill dad, cause he's an asshole. And the Khan was like, <laughs> man who accept evil tentacle god become tentacle fresh right. My point is that when faced with the choice to choose one tyrant over another, he chose the one that wouldn't eternally feast on his soul. Onto the sixth poor excuse of his son, and the first actually interesting meeting, we have Lehman Russ. Because of Russ's wild, untamed brain, he would likely never kneel before a golden sex icon when he was asked to. The Emperor in his infinite wisdom saw this and instead disguised himself as a hobo and entered into Russ's feasting hall. Russ at this point was the King of Fenris, and as we know, the Fenrisian women were pretty much the only ones hardy enough to take a space wolf load, so Russ was pretty smug. The Little E, as I'll call him in his hobo disguise, challenged Lehman to a game that Lehman could pick. The Little E was pretty confident he would win because, you know, he was the Emperor of Mankind and all, and Russ was a, just a drunkard space viking, so you can imagine he was pretty upset when in an eating competition, Russ absolutely dominated him, despite the Little E eating enough to put a feeder couple in the ground. Technically at this point, Russ could have declared himself the winner and the Little E would be forced to serve as Russ's bitch for a year as per their agreement. But Russ liked games and he saw that the Little E had some fire in him. Hence, the next challenge was a drink off. The Little E once again drank like a champion, but Lehman was born to be a wife beating drunk, hence he once again destroyed the Little E. The Little E was pretty shitty at this point. He was the god emperor of mankind and so far he was O from 2. So he yells out, listen here you little shit. You think just you're so fucking good because you can eat and drink and fuck hairy women? But I, I got some news for you. You ain't shit, you little ranger bitch. And soon everyone's going to make jokes about you penetrating your fucking dogs. Lehman then calmly issued the third and final challenge, a fight. As Lehman rose to begin this challenge, the Big E was like, Okay, Lamau, and took off his disguise, suddenly massive in form and clad in golden shining armor. With a single punch of his power fist, Lehman got knocked out and broke his fang. When he came to, he smiled and pledged his loyalty to the Big E, a loyalty that would never waver. If only the Big E punched the rest of his sons, maybe they would have learnt some discipline and wouldn't have gone all, you know, pledged soul to hell. The seventh Primarch, also the least funny one, Rogel Dawn. Rogel was a cold, staunch and stotic man, very similar to Perturabo. The key difference was that Big E picked favourites and Rogel came out on top. Dawn was very autistic, like he actually could not lie and always sought out the truth, hence why Chaos never even bothered to try to turn Dawn to their side. Dawn was so autistic that the warp seized up and died around him, hence when the Emperor arrived, Dawn already had a large spacefaring empire as well as considerable levels of military might. The power of autism. Their meeting was very bland, as Dawn instantly pledged allegiance and assumed his role as an unbreakable wall in which the enemies of the Imperium would break upon, time and time again. Time mark number 8, we have Evil Space Batman, Conrad Curse. As we have discussed, some Primarchs had easy lives as with privileged white kids, and others had rough lives where they got nails in their brain, but none had it rougher than Conrad, whose space shuttle crashed through his planet's crust and released them into lava. Hence, Conrad's childhood was spent clawing his way through magma until he eventually reached the surface, which was even worse as the entire planet was full of rapists and murderers. After a few years of hiding and living off rats, Conrad was strong enough to basically scare an entire planet into submission by being a one-man planet-wide police force. My favourite scene being when a girl tried to kill herself but was stopped by Conrad as suicide was against the law. He then proceeded to torture and murder the girl as punishment. Nice one, Conrad. When the Big E arrived, he pulled a bit of a dick move. See, his armor was always super shiny and glowy. For most people, this would cause them to shield their eyes. But for the people on Conrad's planet, people who had never seen the sun and had like zero vitamin D, his armor was so bright that it burnt out their retinas, causing mass blindness. Conrad could see the future, so he was aware that his father would one day come for him. The Big E brought Ferris, Fulgrim, Lorga and Dawn with him, as well as a quarter of a million Astartes in a very strange show of force. Conrad saw the future of each of the Primarchs as they introduced themselves, Ferris without a head, Lorgar ascending as a demon lord, Rogel getting gangbanged, and Fulgrim being a slithery little snake. 
Brit Major Kill. If Conrad knew how each of the Primarchs would end up, why didn't he say anything? Shut your filthy cow's loving mouth, Timmy, before I tell Conrad that you're going to kill yourself. Conrad's visions were very cryptic, especially at this point in time, hence he didn't really comprehend entirely what he was seeing. Finally, the Emperor spoke, and as he did, Conrad had the worst vision of all. He saw himself being violently assassinated, and he tried to claw his own eyes out. However, the biggie put his hand on Conrad's head and restored his sanity, an ability that Conrad really needed, and he told him his name and that he was coming home. At this point, Conrad was just the Night Haunter, but the biggie already had names for each Primarch. Most of these names were not the ones the Primarchs ended up with, but some, like Perturabo, knew their own true names from the get-go. Once again, a seamless Primarch adoption, but at least this one involves some pretty heavy foreshadowing, as each of the futures Conrad saw would more or less come to pass. The next Primarch, the glorious Hawkboy Sanguinius, had a pretty basic bitch meeting with the Big E. After uniting Baal, Sanguinius was giving a speech to his people, and he really flexed his angel status by flying at the end of it. The Big E watched the speech from the crowd, but he didn't have his disguise on or anything, so he would have stood out as a towering golden beacon. After the speech, the Big E approached Sanguinius, who fell to his knees and wept, probably because of how much he loathed himself. Sanguinius then joined the Imperium without issue and began clapping a lot of cheeks. The 10th Primarch was also the one of the ones we know the least about, Ferris Manus. Before he became about a head shorter thanks to Fulgrim touching a penis-shaped sword, Ferris was an extremely loyal, strong, and level-handed Primarch. It's a shame that we didn't actually get to see more of him before his death, but in saying that, his death was very impactful and important to the plot. Just as a note, Ferris Manus means Iron Hand in Latin. His hands are made of iron. His legion are called the Iron Hands, and they cut off their hands and replace them with iron in honor of their father, who, as I said, has iron hands. Ferris was all about being tough. He drowned a metal dragon in lava, and then he made himself known to his planet and helped them enter into a golden age. He still encouraged the many conflicts they had with each other in order to ensure only the strongest survived. So when the Big E arrived, him and Ferris fought an epic anime tier battle. Ferris pledged himself to his father afterwards, as he finally found an opponent that surpassed him. Respectable. So far there does seem to be a trend of Primarchs who got punched in the face by the Emperor, remaining incredibly loyal. On to the 11th, we have the second missing Primarch, who was likely exterminated by the Imperium for unknown reasons. I'm just going to take a stab in the dark here and say it was because they watched anime without subtitles, despite the fact that they couldn't speak Japanese. Number 12th, we have the poster boy of why abortion should be legalized everywhere, Angron. Angron in the Emperor's meeting was by far the most mishandled by Daddy E. Angron was instantly enslaved upon his landing at his planet and was forced to fight as a gladiator, eventually getting nails stamped into his brain that was slowly killing him. Rough. He eventually escaped along with thousands of his gladiator brothers and sisters, and despite being a literal Spartacus, him and his depleted army were soon surrounded by a much greater and better armed force from different regions of the planet. The Emperor beamed down to Angron on the eve of battle and was like, You gave it a good shot, son. Now come with me and let's conquer the galaxy. And Angron was like, Dope. Let me tell all my gladiator brothers and sisters that we've been saved. And the Big E was like, Oh, oh no, they, they smell like shit and they all have nails in their brains. No, they're not invited. So Angron was like, Okay, fuck you, I'm not going. And the Big E was like, the Big E then kidnapped Angron and took him aboard his ship, resulting in the massacre of his gladiator family. Angron even killed a custodes and tried to attack the Emperor in retaliation after his abduction. Now the Big E is usually pretty good at reading people and understanding the best course of action. He knew Primarchs like Lehman and Ferris would require a show of force, whilst others like Fulgrim or Sanguinius were destined to kiss ass from the get-go. All Angron wanted was for the Emperor to drop in some Marines, Custodes, or even himself to kick some ass alongside him and his gladiators, and then BAM, you would have had a loyal Angron. Maybe the Big E was just annoyed at Angron turning him down initially, but either way, it's not hard to see why Angron would betray the Big E with a start like this. Uno 13, we also have the amount of Black Crusades Abaddon has failed, as well as the most privileged Primarch, Gulliman. Gulliman didn't have foresight, stealth abilities, warp powers, insane strength, insane speed, wings, or even a sense of humor, but he is arguably the most powerful Primarch. Why? He has super administration powers, which while they are indeed lame, means he conquered the tits out of his star system, and he built an entire mini Imperium by the time the Biggie had found him. Gulliman swore instant fealty to the Big E without issue, as he already knew he was created for a purpose and got pretty excited about the prospect of building a galactic empire. 
Once again, a pretty boring meeting of father and son, but matches pretty well with what you'd expect from the G-Man. On to the 14th, we have another unfortunate meeting, Mortarion. Morty had landed on a gassed up planet full of necromancers and people who the necromancers were necromanting on. Morty was adopted by the most powerful of necromancers, who was also a shitty dad. After a time, Morty escaped and met with people in a valley below, seeing their plight and declared rebellion against the necromancers. With Morty being a Primarch as well as highly resistant to gas attacks, it didn't take him too long for him and his merry men to kill the necromancers bar one, his own necro daddy, who was a mountain so tall and poisonous that not even Morty could survive it. When the biggie arrived, Morty got really jealous as his people were in awe of a golden tanned hot man who promised them truth for salvation. They liked Morty, but he looked like a cancer patient on their third cycle of chemotherapy, which just isn't the normal look of an inspiring hero. When the biggie approached Morty, he said, Come on Morty, if you can't kill your necro daddy, then you're a worthless piece of shit and you need to come on my adventures. But but, but if you can, then, then, I'll, then I'll fuck off. And Morty was like, Oh, oh jeez dad, uh, okay I'll do it. Hence Morty climbed up the tallest mountain and proceeded to get skull fucked by the gas. As he dropped to his knees and the necro daddy pretended to kill him, the biggie was like, Surprise motherfucker! And cut necro daddy in half, saving Mortarion. As per their deal, Morty did pledge himself to the Big E, but he was incredibly salty that the Big E stole his kill. Which is stupid, Morty got saved, but what can you expect from a guy whose brain's been non-stop exposed to gas so toxic it would make Auschwitz look harmless? Onto the final stretch, we have the 15th Primarch, the big red nerd himself, Magnus. Magnus and the Emperor had been psychically communicating for years before they met, hence Magnus was one of the Emperor's favourite sons, as he was the only one that had psychic powers to rival his own. Out of all the Primarch meetings, this one was by far the easiest, other than Horace's meeting, as Magnus had already pledged himself to his father years before he arrived officially. I've got a Thousand Sons video coming out soon, so get keen to learn the nitty gritty of Magnus and how arrogance always leads to downfall. The 16th Primarch, the Arch Bold Cunt, was called Horus. Horus was the first son to be found by the Emperor, but the details of his finding are very sketchy. Some records say he grew up on the nearby planet of Chthonia, however his accent sounded fake to some of the keen-eared Chthonians, whilst other records state that despite landing on Chthonia, he was found very early by the Big E and grew up on Terra, only adopting the Chthonia's facade as a way to help secure the loyalty of the Marines harvested from that planet. Either way, Horus's time with the Emperor meant that he had become the Emperor's favourite son, despite his obvious lack of hair, and their meeting was incredibly easy, as there's a good chance Horus was a literal child when it occurred. The 17th Primarch was the second most evil bold cunt, Lorgar. Now I'm not going to say Lorgar was molested as a child, but he did land on a planet that was extremely religious, and if there's something we've learned about religious people, is that they love touching kids. Lorgar spent most of his life creating a religion based around the eventual arrival of the God Emperor of Mankind, and he used this religion to crush the opposing religion, which Loki prayed the Chaos Gods. After genociding a large population of his planet in a religious war, the Emperor arrived. Now it's not hard to see why people thought the Biggie was a god. He had insane superpowers, a flaming sword, was constantly glowing, and he looked like a god. Lorgar was like, my god, you've arrived, and the Emperor's like, I'm not a god, I'm a scientist. And then Lorgar was like, only a true god would say he isn't a god. What a god. This trend of Lorgar thinking the Big E was a god would eventually come to a head, as the word bearers were extremely slow at conquering planets, as they would stay on said planets and convert them to the Imperial cult. Hence, after a good old fashioned bit of mind rape by the Big E, Lorgar was no longer a fan. Either way, once again, this was an easy Primarch, as he looked up to his father as a god. The 18th Primarch was also the cuddliest, despite looking the most evil, Vulcan. Vulcan and the Emperor had a really cool meeting. It wasn't a punch on, but it was still quite challenging. See, Vulcan was now the lord of his planet and had just fisted some Dark Elves, really hard. Hence, there was a huge celebration. During the celebration, the Big E came in a disguise and said he could beat anyone there in any of the competitions. Vulcan accepted this challenge as the Big E then said, whoever loses become the other person's bitch which was his standard challenge request by this point. After a full week of challenges where neither the Big E nor Vulcan came out on top, they had one final challenge. Go out, kill a giant fire-breathing salamander, and then bring it back. Fair enough. Vulcan found a big chungus and smashed its brains in. However, as he was carrying it back to the village, the volcano he was on coincidentally erupted and threw him off a cliff. 
He clung onto it with one hand, but was unable to pull himself up, as he did not want to let go of his big ass salamander. Eventually the big E came, and as expected, with his big dick measuring contests, he had the bigger salamander. He used its body to create a bridge to save Vulcan, and they returned back to the village. Vulcan was declared the winner, as he, you know, he had his salamander still, and the big E didn't. But then our big scary Terry teddy bear was like, No, my friends, this golden white man is the true winner here. He saved my life. Any man that values life over dick measuring is worthy of my service. Hence the Imperium gained Vulcan, a man with a heart of gold, unless you're an Eldar child. The 19th and 2nd or 3rd last Primarch is Corvus Korax, aka the dude Conrad wishes he was. I guess Angron also wishes he was Corvus, as Corvus actually led a successful rebellion against the cruel overlords of his planet. The Big E also came to Corvus in a similarly unique position to Angron. See, 90% of Primarchs were already the lords and kings of their planets before the Emperor arrived, except for Corvus and Angron, who were still in the middle of their respective uprisings. With Angron, he saw a man who had no chance of completing his uprising, whilst Corvus was stuck in a unique dilemma. See, Corvus found nukes that he could use on key enemy positions, killing thousands of innocents but saving millions overall. The Big E came to Corvus, and the two talked in great lengths about important shit that the audience wasn't privy to. Then the Big E left and allowed Corvus to make his decision without offering any help or aid at all. Corvus ended up nuking the Overlords and forcing the survivors to agree to a treaty before then joining the Emperor on his crusade. The Emperor wanted to see if Corvus had the balls to make the tough decisions, and he was pleased when he saw that he did. And finally, the last Primarch slash Primarchs, Alpharius Omegon. True to their nature of nobody knowing what the fuck the Alpha Legion are doing, we have no real idea about the origin of Alpharius Omegon. One story has Alpharius landing on a planet where he waited for aliens to come, kicked the aliens' ass, and stole their ship, where he then flew to the Emperor. Another story has Alpharius try to assassinate Horus, and then there's another story that Alpharius got mind raped by evil Xenos until the Emperor came and blew them all up. None of these stories explain Omegon at all either, so I'm genuinely dreading the day when I have to attempt to make an Alpha Legion lore video. And that does us for today guys. The meet and greet of all 20 of the Primarchs. Everyone loves Primarchs, and I thought it'd be cool to highlight their meetings with their glorious golden daddy. Some are way cooler than others, but all of them match their character, as well as their mental disorder pretty well. I should probably just make a video about how cooked all their brains are to be honest, there's a lot of content there. If you liked the video and want to support the channel, then Patreon is the place to be. Only $1 gives you access to everything, or $10 gives you access to the hentai calendar coming out this week, which I have blown over two grand on. Best investment ever. Click subscribe, then click the real subscribe button for more. Join the Discord for my memes, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.